Well, it's May, and that's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, which is a time to celebrate the stories of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders living in the United States. I'm Sonia Bethija. I'm the Vice President of Communications at Campaign Legal Center. And Campaign Legal Center, or CLC, is an organization that works to ensure that every eligible citizen can participate in the democratic process from voting to making sure that they can um, run for office and participate through having um, fair campaign finance laws um, to ensuring that lines are drawn fairly and in our voting maps and that we have ethics in government. And I'm joined today with our partners from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. And I'm gonna to turn to Terry Elminis to introduce herself. Thank you, Cynthia. I am Terry Alminis. I'm Senior Director of Census and Voting Programs at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Um, and I'm very happy uh, to be here today. Thank you for having me. I'll turn it over to Martin. Thanks, Terry. Hi, my name is Martin Kim. I'm the Associate Director of Immigration Advocacy at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Also really happy to be here. If you can kind of tell us a little bit about Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, um, the organization and what the mission is. Absolutely. So Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, it's a long name. Uh, we're a civil rights organization dedicated to uh, make sure that all Americans, including Asian Americans, can benefit equally from and contribute to the American dream. And our mission is to advance the civil and human rights for Asian Americans and to build and promote a fair and equitable society for all. You know, I mentioned Asian American Pacific Islander, often abbreviated as AAPIs. Could you tell me a little bit about who makes up this community and this group of individuals? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I want to start just by making sure we're clear that these are, even within the broad category of API, we're talking about two very distinct populations, depending on whether you count Asian alone or in conjunction with other ethnicities and races, Asian Americans make up about uh, 18 to 20 million uh, uh, people in the US, and there are about 1.4 million Pacific Islanders in the US. And this is a population that's seen rapid growth in the past few decades. Uh, this data is a little bit old now, but if you look at the period from 2000 to 2010, uh, Asian American population grew by 46%, and the Pacific Islander population grew by about 40%. It's also important to note that uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are uh, a very and uniquely immigrant population. So about two thirds of Asian Americans and about one sixth of Pacific Islanders are foreign born. Even within, even this statistic about number or percentage of uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who are immigrants who are foreign born varies a lot by subpopulation. So if we're looking, for example, at Nepalese Americans, we see that about 84% of Nepalese Americans are um, immigrants or foreign born. That's the highest percentage among AAPI populations. And then uh, among the Hmong, popu Hmong American population, about 35% of Hmong Americans are foreign born. So you see there's a huge range within the category of Asian Americans. If we look at Asia and Pacific and the Pacific Islands, we're looking at a majority of the total world population. So the population within the U.S. is extremely diverse. We're talking about 50 plus ethnic groups and hundreds, if not thousands of spoken languages. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a snapshot of this uh, population. You know, that kind of leads me to the next question. Obviously, this is a very diverse group of communities and people. And so you know, when talking about AAPIs, you know, how do we ensure that when we, we talk about this community that we're not flattening it into, you know, one monolithic community and that we're able to recognize that each group has unique needs and a unique identity? What What's your advice there? How, how is that achieved? So I think the first thing is just simply recognizing that this extremely diverse population is not a monolith. So um, again, to, to re-emphasize this idea of different needs 
even within this broad terminology, uh, we can think about the needs that arose out of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Um, we did see a rise, unfortunately, in targeted attacks against people of Asian descent or who are perceived to be um, individuals of Asian descent. We have uh, seen that both in the Asian American population and to some degree also within the Pacific Islander population. But we also saw specific needs of Pacific Islanders during this time, right? In terms of access to certain benefits, healthcare, et cetera. And so acknowledging that these are, there are a variety of groups within this uh, very, very broad classification allows people to recognize and, and sometimes also for the government to recognize, oh, okay, we need to pay more attention to the subcategories to, to uh, within this broad uh, population. And I know um, something that we and Terry specifically has been working on a lot uh, has been pushing for collection of disaggregated demographic data, especially uh, specifically for this point, right? Like if the government doesn't have a sense of the different of the richness of the population doesn't collect information about the richness of the population it becomes very hard to address all of the different needs arising in in uh among different communities within uh the broader asian american and pacific islander community part of the conversation today is really trying to understand um participation in, um, of asian americans and pacific islanders in the democratic process and so understanding that this is largely um, an immig immigrant group um, who have naturalized or, you know, over time become citizens. Can you talk a little bit about the history of AAPIs in the United States and really how immigration laws have impacted AAPIs participation um, in democracy? Absolutely. I think this is a great question. So if we look at the history, and you know, I'm not a historian by trade, right? Uh, but if we look at the history of America, we see a history of systemic racism and exclusion. So it's no surprise then that when we look at uh, the history of Asian Americans, we see these same themes, right? Um, just if we look at even the earliest, early immigration to the US by Asian immigrants, um, we see kind of that was being done. There, there was a need for uh, workers on, for example, the Transcontinental Railroad. We see a lot of Chinese immigrants come and we see the backlash to that immigration and explicit exclusion, right? The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first law, immigration law that really targeted a very specific group of people and prohibited them from immigrating, from becoming citizens. We see this history of exclusion from public schools or sharing uh, public spaces with white Americans. We see, uh, you know, extending further, we see um, an intervention in, uh, we see the in, in incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, right? Coming back to this idea of, uh, and I'll talk about this a little later, of this idea of Asian Americans somehow being disloyal or perpetually foreign. Um, we've seen scapegoating and violence in the wake of 9-11 towards Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities that like history extended in the Muslim ban under then President Trump. And, you know, hate crimes and incidents targeting Asian Americans during COVID. So we see this long history of exclusion of racism and racist structures. And when we're talking about, um, I, I also do want to mention, of course, we Asian Americans are not passively experiencing this history, right? We're also participating, pushing back against these attempts from the very beginning. Uh, and um, unfortunately, though, we've also seen the use of Asian Americans, for example, as a wedge group by people in power against other communities of color. Um, and then again, Asian Americans rising up in solidarity with other communities of color to push back against uh, various racist laws and policies. But to the second part of your question about immigration and the history of immigration, um, f f the way I think about immigration law in my work is in terms of immigration law literally being the system or structure that dictates who can become, who has the right to be American, 
who can become citizens, who can be part of the body politic, right? And for much of American history, those laws are racist. They're deliberately uh, focused on whiteness and the idea of America as white. And for the better part of America's history, voting was denied to Asian Americans because Asian Americans, Asian immigrants were not allowed to become citizens. So I've already mentioned the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, we see other attempts in law to exclude Asian Americans from the general rights uh, that other Americans uh, uh, had. For example, like we see uh, quote unquote alien land laws that prevent Asian immigrants from owning property. Something that unfortunately has come back in the form of attacks on certain individuals now, some, you know, 200 years, a little less than 200 years later. Uh, and so I mentioned that just to point out that this is not some relic of the past, right, in terms of these racist structures and, and policies in place, but that these ugly stereotypes uh, persist today in terms of Asian Americans being outsiders or aliens or perpetual foreigners. Um, and, and that's something we continue to fight back against. When it comes to this community, it seems like a lot of, um, you know, the barriers that the community faces are rooted in, especially when it comes to voting, are rooted in, you know, those discriminatory immigration laws. But Terry, I'd love to hear, you know, in the work that you do um, on voting and census, if you could maybe talk a little bit about the barriers um, to the ballot box that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders face today. Um, what what are we trying to do or what is, what is Advancing Justice AJC trying to do to overcome those barriers? Sure. Thanks. And uh, thank you to Martin for uh, laying it, uh, laying our history out uh, so well. And I'm going to actually start and pick up from where he ended around this idea of the perpetual foreigner stereotype, because it is unfortunately something that we see manifested even in the voting uh, context in um, in erecting a barrier to uh, participation by our communities. Insidious manifestations of this stereotype can actually be found in verbal attacks that have been levied against Asian American candidates and voters, uh, negative political ads that use the misconception of Asia or some Asian country uh, as an enemy to the U.S., and manipulation of images of candidates to trigger negative stereotypes of that um, candidate of color, for example, perhaps darkening the skin of candidates things that we've seen occur in other communities. Um, I will give uh, an example uh, from the state of New Jersey, um, starting with, um, not just starting, I'm sure it happened before, but my examples will start uh, in 20, uh, in 2005, in fact, we saw a Trenton radio hosts using racial slurs and mock Asian gibberish uh, during an on-air radio show um, being done to demean a Korean American mayoral candidate. At the time, fast forward to 2017, we saw Asian American candidates being targets of racist propaganda. Uh, in Edison, uh, we saw two school board candidates who were targeted with anti-immigrant mailers uh, that said things like make Edison great again. Uh, it called for the candidates deportation and included other derogatory statements. Uh, that same year, we saw the sick mayoral candidate and Hoboken being targeted with racist flyers um, that were placed on car windshields uh, around the city. Uh, the message on that flyer said, quote unquote, don't let terrorism take over our town above the image of the candidate. And then finally, uh, 2018, and then repeating itself in 2021, um, the New Jersey Republican Party actually distributed campaign uh, mailers about current Congressman Andy Kim, who was running as a challenger, then with the words, uh, something is really fishy about Andy Kim in a typeface called Chop Suey, which whole nother issue we can talk about the naming of fonts. Uh, but um, we are, and along with that was the picture of a dead fish on ice in July, 2021, when Congressman Kim was being, you know, was, was running, uh, rerunning, he was targeted in a video made by his challenger, by the Republican challenger, uh, where she says about Congressman Kim, 
quote unquote, he doesn't represent our interest. He's not one of us. And unfortunately, that is a constant refrain we hear, right, um, about our community. And the reason why it's so important is it both can have a chilling effect on Asian Americans wanting to run for office, but it also has a chilling effect on uh, Asian American voters or potential Asian American voters because it is very unwelcoming, right? It's very much a statement of you don't belong here. You're not one of us. You are, um, you know, somehow un-American, less American. Uh, So that is one uh, big aspect. It also manifests itself at the ballot uh, box when we've seen unwarranted voter challenges due to this uh, idea, perception, the stereotype that, oh, you must be, Asian American voters must be um, ineligible to vote. Uh, Or even with poll workers who uh, act suspiciously towards Asian American voters for having an accent, right? For whom English is a second language. And that can eventually lead to the denial of the right to vote in certain more egregious examples. That language barrier is also a major barrier to the ballot box for Asian Americans, as Martin outlined in the history of the racist immigration laws uh, in our country, a large portion of our community is immigrant. And this means that three in four Asian Americans speak a language other than English at home. And of them, or not of them, just generally of the entire population, a third of Asian Americans are limited English proficient or have some difficulty with the Asian language. And of course, uh, naturally, we see a even higher percentage of Asian American adults being limited English proficient. That becomes a problem in the voting context because as we know, voting materials are often written at very high levels of um the English language. I think some studies that have been done have shown that it's either sort of at a 12th grade level or a collegiate level. So it can be confusing uh, and difficult. Uh, We know ballot initiatives often are written in a way that are meant to be confusing um, uh, and are not written in plain English, making it difficult for even native uh, English speakers to understand. So you can only imagine how much more difficult it becomes Uh, in that process uh, when you have a voting, uh, voting materials in a language that is the second, you know, language or third, fourth uh, for the person. And it's written in a way that is not always the most comprehensible. And finally, uh, along um, with that idea of limited English uh, proficiency, we find that um, because of that, people may be less willing to participate. And to the extent it's the first time that they're voting because they've naturalized, right? Um, If they have a bad experience, we know from studies that having one bad experience will dissuade people from trying to vote again. And therefore we have all of these sort of obstacles in the way um, to engage Asian American voters, which is why we continue to see an ongoing uh, gap in voter participation for the community as compared uh, particularly uh, to the white population. Knowing that these are all challenges that the, the community faces, what um, is Advancing Justice AAJC, you know, what are the solutions that are available to, you know, combat um, this disenfranchisement that's occurring for various different reasons of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? Certainly one of the uh, tools we have in our toolbox would be litigation. We are currently involved in two voting right cases, uh, one in Arizona and one in Georgia. In Arizona, we filed a lawsuit to challenge House Bill uh, 2492 and 2243 on behalf of Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. These two state laws are designed, right, uh, to restrict and deny the voting rights of Arizona's voters of colors and naturalized voters and combined, they establish various citizenship and proof requirements for voting along with a swift voter cancellation uh, process and a creation of an anyone can accuse, if you will, investigation system that refers accused voters who are unable to provide onerous evidence of citizenship to criminal investigations. Uh, So, and in Georgia, 
along with other Advancing Justice affiliates, we are challenging um, SB 202, Georgia's sweeping anti-voter uh, voting bill as erected um, as erecting unconstitutional barriers intended to silence Asian American voters. In the Georgia case, we uh, wanted to file the case on behalf of Asian American voters because of the growing community uh, and the growing up influence of Asian American voters in Georgia and to make sure that the needs of our communities are addressed in the litigation, uh, even though there are many other cases that are also uh, um, ha have been filed in that uh, in that state and in the in, in uh, against that bill. Um, for example, we wanted to make sure that the language barriers issue for Asian Americans was definitely, um, you know, front and center for at least one of the cases. Uh, litigation, of course, has been Im uh, important because in addition to sort of the long haul of uh, that can be involved in litigation, we also have opportunities to find um, sort of short-term solutions. So in Arizona, going back to Arizona, prior to the um, uh, 2022 midterm elections, we sought a preliminary injunction to block the imp implementation of the voter purge bill, right? House Bill 2243. Um, uh, we were able to secure an agreement with the defendant that they would not take any action to implement or enforce that bill, uh, HB 2243, in a manner that would remove voter eligibility or disqualify any otherwise valid ballots prior to January 2023, thereby ensuring that the midterm election would not be subject to these problematic provisions. This was particularly important because we heard from folks on the ground that Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander voters were expressing concern and confusion about the bills and whether they would uh, be in effect for uh, the election and really questioning whether it was safe for them to vote. And so being able to have a court order stipulating that these bills would not be in effect for the midterm election was really critical for our communities to feel safe and um, you know able uh, to participate uh, freely and effectively in the election. So that's sort of on the litigation front, but there are other avenues to try to help uh, um, eradicate uh, these barriers. And uh, certainly on the policy front, we do a lot of work, um, whether it's around uh, sort of voting rights, the Voting Rights Act, ensuring um, you know enforcement of the provisions of the Voting Rights Act, particularly uh, related to Section 203, the language assistance provision that requires certain jurisdictions that meet a threshold to um, uh, affirmatively provide language assistance during the election process. Uh, Section 208 of the Voting Rights Act, which uh, you know requires uh, uh, election officials to allow voters, um, well, the, the right under Section uh, 208, it allows voters who need assistance uh, due to either blindness, disability, or the inability to read and write English, which would include a limited English proficient uh, voters, you know, the ability to bring somebody of their choosing in to assist them into the ballot, you know, into the ballot box, into the polling booth to assist them with voting so long as that person is not their employer or their union representative. Um, it can be somebody who, it could be their child, it could be somebody, um, anybody that they can bring into the ballot box. And unfortunately, what we've seen is poll workers often are not as familiar with the federal laws. And so they would often, um, you know, look to deny uh, people their rights under Section 208 to bring assistance um, in and to the point around education. So that is part of what we also try to do, not just educate, um, you know, say election uh, officials and work with them to make sure their poll worker training is, you know, addresses the needs of LEP voters or limited English proficient voters and the like, but also educating our own community members to know what their rights are. We have a Section 208 fact sheet um, to pick up that line on 208 that uh, includes, it's a, in sort of a, you know, a Q and A form or frequently asked question form. And one of the questions says, what should I do if my poll worker won't let me vote? And we say, show them this fact sheet, show them exactly what provision in the federal bill provides this right. And then we also run an Asian language hotline that people can call if they need um, further assistance. The last thing um, I will note that in the policy world, it is also um, broader uh, with respect to both um, 
making sure that the Voting Rights Act is as robust as possible. We have unfortunately seen um, some, uh, you know, debilitating Supreme Court decisions uh, that have really, um, you know, uh, reduced the uh, the ability to rely on the Voting Rights Act as fulsomely as we have been uh, in the past. And Congress certainly has a job to do to restore and modernize the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but we also have opportunities around election um, administration uh, policy and election reform. Uh, the important thing, I think, for us when we do that work is to look at it uh, from the perspective of a lot of these bills are somewhat um, neutral, right? They don't they don't target uh, per se communities of color, whether in a positive. If it does, it's usually more in a negative way. Uh, but they can still have outsized effects on our community. So one example I will give is just automatic voter registration. You know, it, it, in concept, it sounds like, you know, something that would be beneficial for all to put the burden on, for voter registration on the government rather than on individuals. But the big uh, component of it that we caution people to be very thoughtful and mindful about is that automatic voter registration could also uh, ensnare people who are ineligible to vote, right? It's just it's part of a, it's a process. It happens. Um, but the problem is in this context, and Martin could definitely um, talk about this uh, more, the consequences are so devastating if, say, a non-citizen were to be captured um, by an automatic voter registration system and automatically registered. They can become deportable. They can become ineligible for citizenship for life. Um, and so these are, are, are massive consequences that are clearly not the purpose of um, the bill. But when we're looking at things like election administration, election reform, we have to be mindful that they can play out differently and that there are unintended consequences that can happen. So we should run the traps and make sure that whatever we're doing addresses all of those needs. And then the last thing I will just note, of course, redistricting is another important component um, that is sort of the uh, precursor, if you will, of, um, to being able to vote because it draws the lines, it draws right the districts in, in uh, for which our uh, our constituents are voting. And so it's important that our communities are able to uh, effectively engage. So both within the actual redistricting um, process itself, making sure that our uh, partners and community members are aware of their rights, how to engage um, and, and the like. It's also working on redistricting reform uh, to make sure that the process is as uh, fair and equitable and accessible um, you know, to all. It's interesting what you say about automatic voter registration, because I think, you know, the voting rights community who works on these issues oftentimes, you know, hails that as, you know, a, a big solution. And so it kind of um, brings me to another question. Uh, you know, Asian American and Pacific Islanders um, have been part of the voting rights movement and, you know, have worked in solidarity with, you know, communities of color and other communities of color, particularly Black Americans and Latino um, communities that also face barriers. So if you could talk a little bit about, you, you know, you mentioned automatic voter registration, but, you know, the differences um, that, you know, you have come to see in terms of the community's needs between other communities of colors, but also where Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC, has worked in solidarity um, to fight some of these larger racial justice issues. The work we do is not just on behalf of the Asian American, but also to build a fair and equitable society for all. So in the work that we do, whether it's in the voting context or broader, we, we always are mindful of how it may or may not impact other communities, uh, particularly communities of color, and making sure that what we're doing doesn't do harm uh, to other groups, right? And so we do work in coalition um, on many issues, voting and census, uh, for sure, uh, consistently, uh, I would say. Uh, I am a co-chair of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights Census Task Force and very active in the Leadership Conference's um, voting task force as well. And so we work and we are able to raise these issues uh, together so that we can try to 
uh, create and, and brainstorm and find solutions that address the needs um, for all our community. So in the automatic voter registration uh, space, I think that there it was in 2009 when this was really first starting to percolate, that was something that I spent a lot of time talking to folks about saying like, hey, what about this community? Um, and this concern and this potential harm. And I think the good news is, you know, more than a decade later, it's not something I have to explain or that I have to raise like, hey, wait a minute, what about this? Because people understand that. Now, we haven't gotten to the solution on, well, we have come to one solution, which is federal laws could be changed. We could have, you know, um, but to the extent that that hasn't happened and it's unclear, you know, um, the will, to have that happen in the near future, uh, we have not found a um, solution where you can have a state law that would then protect right uh, immigrants from uh, federal immigration law consequences uh, for what's happening. So that is something where it's like it's an ongoing conversation, and uh, you know I think that it's what's appreciated is that it, people understand that there's a harm and they understand that there is a need to address it. One frustration can sometimes be there can be a sentiment of, well, let's kick that can down the road, right? Um, and I don't say it, think it's from a malicious place. It's just there is that excitement, as you sort of noted in that, like, but think of how many people we can help, you know, and the harm is so minimal. But my response to that is, but the harm that occurs to the individual is so outsized, right? We're not talking this is a sizable monetary fine, which would still be difficult, but is something that could be a little bit more addressable. You know, who knows? We could create a fund, people, whatever. You can't do a simple fix, right, for those who get um, caught up in that and, and face immigration uh, consequences. So I think that is one area that I would just note. But even in working on the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act back in mid-2000s, that was something that we consciously decided, as Martin had flagged earlier, um, about the um, the fact that particularly those in power will often try to use us as a wedge group. We made that conscientious decision and agreement up front that we would work on reauthorizing all parts of the Voting Rights Act together and that we would not allow people um, to split our communities. And so we had for example, when there was a true challenge to Section 203, the reauthorization of uh, Section 203 on the Voting Rights Act, uh, you know, we had not just our KPAC champions, um, you know, speaking up on the floor or in committee, but we had John Lewis, right, um, being the amazing orator that he was, you know, standing up and speaking up on behalf of language issues, even though for many it may have appeared that it, quote unquote, wasn't something that affected him or his uh, constituents. So I think that it is uh, very much a part of uh, what we do. And the reality is a lot of these um, voter suppression efforts impact all our communities um, in similar ways, uh, in similar fashion. And the reality is the point of it all is to keep silent the voices of the growing um, you know, communities of color so that those in power can stay in power. And just to add on from like an immigration perspective, these areas of collaboration and uh, intersection and solidarity, it, it's also worth noting that similar to the way like the needs of the Asian American and Pacific Islander populations are very different. Like even when we walk, uh, work in solidarity with some other communities of color, it's very important for us to recognize that our needs are not the same and like our issues, right? They like uh, an example I can give you of an issue that we work on both in solidarity and because it affects certain members of our community is the issue of the intersection of the criminal legal system and the immigration legal system. So we know that there are racist structures embedded within the criminal legal system. Uh, and we know also that they disproportionately really harm black and brown communities specifically, right? So when we're working on this issue, it's important for us to recognize the unique perspective and needs of black and brown communities. And yes, we have also communities who are affected. Southeast Asian uh, Americans are deeply affected 
by this intersection for a variety of reasons. And even there, like a lot of our work is making sure that we're working with representatives from the Southeast Asian community, right? That we don't, as like a, um, as a broader group, try to assume that we know everything about the needs of this individual community, right? And work in solidarity both with that community, with our partners working on behalf of Black and Brown immigrants, uh, and work together to correct the injustices of these laws, to disentangle these two systems uh, in solidarity, in recognition that our needs are different, but that we have, we can work together because there are shared areas um, uh, and, and in working together, we, we have more power. We're looking ahead to 2024, another presidential election. Um, what's a major takeaway um, that you would want Asian Americans and their allies to carry forward? Uh, so I think uh, one thing would be just making sure that we are educating uh, voters or potential voters uh, early and often uh, providing assistance as needed. As I mentioned, we have a Asian language hotline 888 API vote that we won jointly with API vote uh, and we provide assistance in eight Asian language languages in an, and in English. In part because, as uh, Martin mentioned, you know, being highly immigrant, being likely that a lot of um, our voters may be first-time voters, our voting processes are can be confusing. Um, you know, they're not uniform, uh, and so making sure that people are aware that, for example, you need to make sure you're registered by a certain time, right, in order to actually vote. I have taken calls on the hotline where somebody calls and they're super excited, and they're like, "I'm ready to vote. What do I need to do?" and the first thing I have to ask them is like, hmm, did you happen to register to vote? And if they say no, then you try to direct them to say, like, keep that enthusiasm up for the next election, um, which is not super satisfying. So another policy solution would be to get uh, same day registration, but in the short term, so educating folks, um, but also working with election officials, right? Even though um, your jurisdiction may not be covered for Section 203 uh, of the Voting Rights Act to provide language assistance, or maybe you work on behalf of a community that can't be covered by Section 203. So I'm thinking like the Haitian community or, um, uh, you know, the Arabic speaking community um, and the like. Um, you can work with them and see if they might be willing to provide some voluntary um, assistance. Arm yourself with some census data to say, hey, you have a growing community here. There's a need. Uh, maybe we can do some low hanging fruit. You know, can we translate some materials? Would you be willing to share that? If we help recruit some bilingual poll workers, would you be willing to staff them? If we help figure out which polling places, you know, those types of things. I think that uh, election officials, um, and the earlier you do that, the better, because the closer you get to the actual election, of course, election officials will be very, um, you know, uh, busy and swamped and maybe not able um, to really entertain these ideas. So I would say start now. Um, you know, 2023 is the perfect time to build those relationships, have those conversations and try to help um, with all of that. And at the end of the day, I think it's just helping um, voters know uh, where to go um, and, and how to engage. And the last thing I will just quick plug, we will be issuing in about a, a, a month's time uh, post-election survey that we did around Asian American voters and non-voters um, that really kind of try to look at some of the barriers and some of the experiences of um, our communities in trying to vote. So definitely take take a look at that and see what might be um, helpful around that. Martin? And yeah, and if I can chime in just from the immigration perspective, two things I want to highlight very quickly. One is if you're eligible to naturalize, if you're eligible to apply for citizenship, the process is long, right? So <laughs> by by no means can we promise that if you start the process today, will you be ready for 2024? But uh, definitely want to encourage folks who are eligible to apply to naturalize. And we understand there are, again, to go back to these systems, right? The systems in place are, are worse than imperfect, right? They are deliberately, unfortunately, designed to make it hard to, in some in many cases to naturalize but uh, there are resources available and that's work that um, we engage in and the second thing i want to flag is for people who are not eligible to naturalize but are uh, asian you know still part of our communities um, the definition of civic engagement goes beyond voting 
right? There are so many things you can do, uh, even as a non-citizen, in terms of educating lawmakers, being active in your community, uh, advocating for positive changes for your community, and reminding elected fish officials that in a representative democracy, you know, the our elected officials should not just be representing voters, but all members of the community, including uh, those who can't vote, those who are non-citizens, and, and so on and so forth. So just two very quick plugs there. Thank you so much. And, you know, I just want to make sure for those listening that they know, you know, to check out um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice AJC's website at advancingjustice-aajc.org, especially in a month or two when that report that Terry mentions comes out. And if you'd like more information about Campaign Legal Center, you can visit us at campaignlegal.org. But thank you so much, um, Terry and Martin, for your time today and happy Heritage Month and uh, look forward to continuing this conversation another time. Thank you.